Well, first and foremost, I would like to thank everybody for taking the time out of their schedule uh, to take some time and listen to this presentation. This is the first time I've done something like this. And while I'd like to think I know a lot about fish, uh, technology uh, is something that is something I'm not as good at. So bear with me on the presentation, the, the visuals of that. Uh, I haven't done something like this since high school, which has been about 20 years now. So I hope that is okay. But more importantly, I'd like to think that the information is gonna be okay. So those are the caveats and, and the disclaimers that I'm putting in uh, first. So the idea on it is principles of stocking your reef tank. And it applies to any fish tank or anything. And I decided to go with uh, principles on this uh, rather than rules, because there seems that there's so many rules uh, that people say fish per gallon, what can go in, how many sizes. But for every rule that there is, I find that there's an exception to the rule. So it's a lot like the English language in that regards, where uh, it just kind of seems a little made up. So if we focus on the principles, what we can do is end up having a lot more success in the long run. Uh, why I'd like to think I know a little bit about fish, I'll give you a little bit of background about me, is I have always loved fish from uh, having a, uh, a beta at about five years old, all through high school, I ended up having a basement full of fish tanks uh, that I was breeding a bunch of different fish. And, and this was all that I was into uh, through high school until I moved to a place where I couldn't have a fish tank. And, and so for a few years, I didn't have a fish tank. But then as soon as I was on my own again, and, and I could get uh, a fish tank, it started with a, a little uh, five gallon, then I went to a 10 gallon, then a 65 gallon. Um, and most of us can understand how that cycle goes. Uh, I've been working in the industry uh, at a pet store, a high-end uh, fish store that takes care of customers' tanks since 2007. I've been doing it full-time since 2008. Um, in that time, I've taken care of planted tanks, discus tanks, fish only tanks, cichlids, uh, reef tanks. Now I like planted tanks. I like taking care of corals. I like inverts, but I love fish and I love to know about them. I can't get enough about it. I have a very addictive type personality where if I get into something, I'm really into it. And along with that, I also hate being wrong. So and whenever somebody stumps me on something, I've got to know the answer. So it means that I've pretty much read everything I can get my hands on, whether it's magazines, books. I've even had some college uh, books uh, as far as public aquaria. I just can't get enough of that. So, but what I have found is that just because something's written in a book doesn't mean that the book is right. So I've learned lessons the hard way on what should be okay to, to be successful with it, um, but ended up not being. So in these lessons, I, I hope to convey those to everybody who's listening so that you don't have to make the same mistakes that I did at certain points. And ultimately, the more successful that you are with the tank, the more successful more people are with the tank, the more successful the hobby is going to be. So when we think of a well-stocked tank, I think of this image of you know a little slice of the ocean, right? It's just loaded with fish, loaded with color, so much vibrant, so much activity. And that's what we want, right? Like we can't go diving. We can't go scuba diving all the time. We can't have this every time we look around. So we want to have a little bit of that in the aquariums that we have at our house. But ultimately, it doesn't always work out. And why not? Well, one thing we've got to control is our impulse. You go into a fish store and, and you see something that you like. Oh, and you got to have it. But then what happens? Well, you don't know who to trust. The fish store, they seem knowledgeable. And oftentimes it's because we don't know any better uh, of what we're hearing, the information that we're hearing. I know that there's been many a times when going to different fish stores, hearing uh, some of the advice that's being given, like 80% of it's good advice, but then there's that 20% that can have an effect on how successful somebody's going to be. And you don't know whether you should chime in or not. And especially that's tricky for me because I probably work at a different store. So I don't want to view it as undercutting somebody, but you hate to see somebody walking away with that bad information. Um, and, and people don't know, you don't know anyone that's speaking to you. If they have confidence, that seems like good information. So what happens is people oftentimes take a fish home that maybe would be fine in their tank at a later edition, maybe would never be good in their tank. And it just limits what you can have in your tank moving forward. And so instead of having this full tank, you end up having either a bunch of fish that are hiding, one dominant fish that's attacking everybody. Uh, and it's not that full reef type image 
that we're all hoping to, to have when we start off. And also another uh, part that seems to be difficult for people is when starting off with marine reef tanks is they're made to seem super complex. Like there's all these rules, rules, rules. It's so much maintenance. It's so much expense. There's so much more chemicals involved. And this really holds people from getting off, uh, from starting off on that. Um, but what I found is that yes, it is a bit more expensive starting out, but if you start off an aquarium right, then really it's simple. Yes, you do have that breaking in period, but you have that with fresh water as well that can uh, really be cut down. You're gonna have some ups and downs. It's like a teeter totter uh, on everything, but once you get stabilized, it really stays stabilized and is, is relatively easy to take care of. At least that's what I found um, in doing this. But this is where these principles are gonna come into uh, that I hope help uh, make it simple for people when they're stocking their fish tank. So the number one thing that I think of is what's your must have fish. You see that, that phrase, there's always another fish in the sea. Uh, we use that when talking about other people, but it's really, that phrase exists because there's so many other fish in the sea, right? Uh, there's so many options that we could have. And really, if you're looking through a book or online through some of the online fish stores, you see all these varieties of things and they just look so cool. They look so exotic, but not all of them are going to work together. Some of them have very specific needs. Some of them have general needs. But what I found is if you have that one priority, that one fish that you're going to have, that you just have to have, then working around that makes everything easy. You see, you don't have to learn everything about a marine tank if you do this. What you need to do is find that one fish or, or even coral for that matter, if that's your desire and stock around that. So what is its flow needs? What is its feeding needs? What's its temperament like? What niche does it live? Is it open water? Is it, is it perching fish? Is it territorial? Is it easy going? And so once you have these ideas, then you could build your list, the rest of your fish off of that. You see so many times, uh, and you see it on the forums a lot too, is people want to get this perfect fish list down, right? They, they start and they don't even get started until they have this perfect fish list. And then there's adjustments on it. And they find out that this tank doesn't go with this fish or, or these races won't get along. And so then they're kind of left in this limbo and they don't do anything with it. But the phrase perfect is the enemy of good. It applies equally to fish tanks as it does to building a sports team, right? Is if you're trying to have this perfect list, you're just not ever going to have it. It's just gonna stay there. It, you're never gonna be happy with what you have because it's not perfect. We can't make a perfect reef tank. But if you have that fish uh, that you just, that's what your goal is, well, then you can plan your purchases around that. Even if you see something at the fish store that wasn't on your list, if you know that it's compatible with that priority of yours, well, then you can move on with that. You can decide whether that's a good decision for your tank. Also, that gives you a degree of satisfaction. So if something's going on in your tank, you can have that satisfaction of, well, at least my priority or my must have is I'm working around that. And we can have a degree of contentment with that versus always looking at that grass is greener or what else can I be doing to my purchase? Uh, you don't need to know everything about the reef tank. You just need to know about your priority. Other things to consider is, can I manage its full size? So, so that oftentimes we come across uh, larger fish, fish that grow to a certain size, and people are like, well, A, it, I don't have that big of a tank, it won't grow that big, or B, I can always just catch it out when the need be. Well, let me argue both of those points. So fish that don't reach their full size, the reason for that is something has stunted their growth. So with humans, we kind of think that somebody can be bigger or smaller based on genetics, but there's not as wide of a genetic base on that with fish is because A, they're regionally based, B, they're smaller populations, C, just uh, the natural environments of things has made it so that there's certain species, their sizes and their traits are desirable in that. So they kind of breed for that quality in there. So there's not going to be that, uh, you know, four foot five, pygmy versus the seven foot giant that we see in humans, they're gonna all be very close. Also uh, with freshwater fish, Jack Watley, he's a famed, uh, he was a famed breeder of fish, of discus. And what he did is an experiment, and it's anecdotal, but it, it does hold true, is that he had uh, two 75 gallon tanks. One was loaded with a bunch of baby discus and one only had a few baby discus. And what he would do 
uh, was just do a 10% water change and monitor the nutrient levels on those tanks. And then he also did this in a smaller setting with uh, water changes. He had the same amount of fish in one tank and where he would do 200% water changes a day and the other one would only get a 5% water change. And what would happen is the fish in the cleaner systems ended up growing to their full size, even though the tank was not to their uh, necessarily specification, they continued to grow to that full size without being stunted. Whereas other fish that had more room, they ended up being stunted because the water was more polluted. This works true in saltwater fish too. Oftentimes, if we don't keep the tanks clean, fish actually do exude hormones that stunt their competition's growth, but it also affects their growth as well. So what happens is when we have too small a tank or too dirty of a tank, our fish aren't growing to their proper size. And so that is a stunted growth. And me personally, I don't feel that that's responsible fish keeping. So keep that in mind. The other one that I often hear is that people have plans to catch out the fish and they've got another tank that it can go to or a buddy who's gonna take the fish tank. It's all well and good to plan on catching a fish, but it's just that, it's a plan on catching a fish. Sometimes fish can be incredibly difficult to catch. Sometimes it ends up being very disruptive to the whole tank. It's very stressful, not just for the fish that you're catching, but for all the fish in that tank. And that stress, that cortisol that's released, ends up causing, uh, making them more uh, susceptible to diseases and parasites. Hopefully we're not dealing with that, but that ends up causing problems. Also moving rocks around once they've been well-established can uh, disrupt some of the biofiltration and cultures of, uh, of biofauna that are living in the tank. And this can be detrimental to, to those end results of nutrients as well. Then also going down to that, uh, to, as far as that priority fish, uh, we can do our stocking order around it based on how aggressive it is and how not to best decide how we're going to fill up our tank and get the most out of it. Next is where we find the sources of our information. This is something that is vitally important because if you're walking around with false information, you're not going to be successful in keeping your fish alive, your priority alive, or even just in, in generals of your reef tank. Uh, there was the quote, believe, but verify. And so I found that that's something that's good to go around, whether you're going to the local fish stores or, or whether it's finding information online. Uh, much of the information is presented in a way where it does sound good. It sounds reliable, but when put in practice, it may not be as reliable. Uh, but also there's so much information out there, whether it's on the forums, whether it's on informational websites, that it can also be overwhelming and you don't know who to trust, especially when you think you have uh, experts in the field or fairly knowledgeable people and they're presenting something that's contradictory. So understanding why it's contradictory makes sense because there's multiple ways to have success in a reef aquarium. There's no one right way, but knowing why something is correct can go a long way in having the success that you need in having an aquarium. So one question to ask is, are they trying to tell you something? See, online fish stores, they all have their information pages. Uh, local fish stores, they've got their experts that are working there. But what's the end goal? Are they going to be reliable as far as uh, just telling you what you want to hear so that you walk away with a purchase? I know that many times I, I've turned people away uh, when they're interested in a fish, just because it isn't going to work long term for what the, they want to put forth in there, the amount of effort that they're willing to expend in caring for this fish, even though it's a super cool fish. So keep that in mind as are they trying to sell you something. Another question to ask, is the knowledge firsthand or is this just regurgitation of info from another source? So things like this is just general pet care uh, websites like Spruce Pets. Uh, it's very generic general information. Um, some of it's good but some of it is just regurgitation that they found in other books of people who haven't kept it firsthand. Um, just these uh, anthologies of information, uh, whether it's a, a fish guide. Most people haven't kept the hundreds of fish that are listed in the fish guide. They're just basing it off of, of other information that they've heard. Many books are this way. Another question is, is it up to date? So how we may have been caring for fish, this hobby has been around for going on 40 years now. Um, and information has changed drastically in that period of time. Uh, one, when I was really getting into the saltwater side of the hobby, I was directed to wet web media. And wet web media is still on, and they've got experts on there. But if you look at the website, it's actually kind of old and dated. And some of those experts, they don't update their, uh, the care information on those fish. So it's like if they've been doing it long term for that way, well, 
they don't update with how we can now successfully keep fish and what we've learned about it. Now, all these places have a lot of good information, but not all the information is good. So we need to keep that in mind when parsing through that, but that can be difficult. Even the forums and people who have a, a hundred, have claimed to have firsthand information, well, do we know that they have firsthand information or are we relying on it? Now, it's, it's difficult to have that uh, skeptical view of people, uh, but also some people try to present themselves as uh, being more experienced or more expert than they are. Uh, one thing that drives me nuts is the people who are like, oh yeah, my fish is happy, my fish is healthy, or you can break, you can do this thing that nobody says you can do. I'm having success with it, but they've only had the fish for like two to three weeks. It hasn't really broken into the tank yet and established its full personality. However, that being said, nothing is 100%. There's exceptions to all the rules and keep that in mind. We need to be flexible with that, but if we follow the principles and try to do the best for the fish that we're keeping, we're gonna work with uh, what the numbers kind of say in that. A lot of it's kind of like uh, blackjack, right? There, you can do the right thing in blackjack and still not win the hand. But we wanna try to, to make ourselves statistically as successful as possible because animals' lives are depending on this. Next question is how big or small do you need to go to care for your fish, to care for that priority? Now, something that I tell everybody is bigger is usually better. It's because it ends up being more stable and more forgiving, especially when you're first starting off in the hobby. It's easy to follow the instructions on the fi uh, fish foods about how much to feed. They say feed as much as the fish can eat in two to three minutes, something like that. I find that's way too much food per feeding. It's, uh, it's much better to be closer to 30 seconds on that. However, if you make that mistake, a bigger tank can handle it. Uh, it can handle the overloads of nutrients. Sometimes it can, uh, it can handle rushing things a little bit too is because uh, the toxic buildups don't, don't build up as fast. However, you don't wanna go so big that you can't manage it, manage it or it's too expensive uh, to do the basic uh, uh, tank maintenance that you need to do. Uh, salt can be very expensive if you're doing water changes on a thousand gallon aquarium versus doing water changes on a 75 gallon aquarium. So it's finding that balance between what you can manage, uh, but what you can keep stable. So then ask the needs, what are the needs of that priority fish? That's where it goes back to having that priority fish. That's why I put that as the first question to ask, because if you pick a tank that's the size of your priority, well, then you can work around that. Now, having more space allows for different personalities of fish and it can cut down on aggression. The reason being is because there's more of an area of what fish may want that they can then share. In a small crab tank, if you have a territorial uh, fish, well, it's, it can view that whole tank as its territory. Whereas if you have a, a larger footprint, well, now territories can be broken up and it can be broken up via the aquascape as well. And then more surface area actually e equals more fish in that because the water can hold more oxygen. There's a greater oxygen exchange. And this is one of the most important factors when keeping fish and deciding how many fish you can keep. Because again, in my experience, people want that full tank. They don't want that uh, tank with four or five fish. They want to have it packed to the gills, uh, so to speak, with as many fish as they can get in there. So having a great surface area helps with that. Next, try to use all the levels. This will help the tank seem more full. If you focus on all the levels, uh, it can also cut on aggression because there's less co competition for like-minded species. So some things to keep in mind are what are you going to do in the top levels? Some great fish choices for the top include Antheus, Green Chromis, Fusiliers if you have a big enough tank, Fairy and Flasher Rasses, Zebra, zebra and, uh, and other dart fish. Uh, they like to congregate just above that rock work and they like the flow. So if you get a variety of those fishes, because again, if we look at these reef images, you see not just uh, one species mixed together, you see a lot of these shoaling species shoal together, three or four species at a time. Uh, and so they're comfortable with each other. These are usually generally not very aggressive species of fish. So they can mix and you can have a lot of fish in that level. Now then as you move down to the mid levels, things like swallowtail angels, tangs, some of the other rat species and many of the basslets, they'll occupy these niches of space and they'll occupy and explore the rock work and they'll be around looking at things. So then they're changing the type of fishing behavior. So we've got shoaling fishes at the top, more individualized fishes looking at the middle places. 
Then when we move to the bottom levels, fish such as sand perches, sifter gobies, watchman gobies, dragonets, and jawfish, these guys will occupy that lower level and keep some activity in there. But these guys also are the ones that have a lot of interesting behavior, particularly the watchman gobies as they have that symbiotic relationship with the pistol shrimp, uh, jawfish, and they're constantly working on their burrows and, and how complex they are, but also how nosy they are with the whole world around them. Uh, sifter gobies, uh, as long as you don't have corals on the bottom, watching them sift out. And these are the kind of fish that interest the people that uh, come and visit who are always like, wow, what's that fish? And they have, those are the fish that have a lot of personality. Then you have your side oriented fishes, the ones that can be a little territorial, but can also work in the, in the whole scheme of things. So fish such as clownfish, certain damsel species, gramas. Uh, these fish will kind of pick one area that they hang out with, but they also have interesting behavior as well. And then you've got some of my favorite, the perching fishes, which include hawkfish and blennies. So these fish, people also love these. They all have a very inquisitive, curious look to them. They have a ton of personality. These are some of the guys that recognize you as, as a fish keeper right away. And so by utilizing species in each of these levels, well now suddenly almost everywhere you look in the tank, you now have fish. You have a variety of shapes, you have a variety of colors, and you have a variety of behaviors that get along with each other. The next principle though, slow down. Patience is a virtue. You can be quick, but don't be hasty. The biggest culprit of this is the impulse buy, right? You uh, see something and you know you shouldn't be buying a fish, but you checked it out and, and you're, you're in that mode where you want to get one and, and you just make that impulse decision. Other people want to get everything at once and just load the tank up and then they think that they're going to be done once they've done that. That's a bad idea. Don't do it. Bacterial colonies can only grow so quickly. So we don't want to outpace that beneficial bacteria, that nitrifying bacteria. That's, that's really doing the heavy lifting as far as keeping your water clean. So think of it as like a human city, right? So throughout human history, there's been boom towns. There's been cities that have had explosions in growth. So much for, so that the, the population goes faster than services can keep up with, right? So if you have inadequate infrastructure uh, to care for the actual population, it leads to disease and other problems. Well, something similar can happen in our fish tanks. If we go too fast in the process, well, that bacterial population, the infrastructure that we're using to get rid of the waste and, and to filter and keep everything clean, can't keep up. And so it may not automatically equal problems, but you're increasing your chances that you're going to have that, right? So if we live in a polluted environment, well, we're going to be sicker or more likely to be sick than if we live in a very clean, healthy environment. Now, there are tricks to help speed up that bacterial process. You can use seeded sand. We use live rock to start tanks most of the time. There's bacterial additives and food for the bacteria. But even though they're helping speed up that process, they do only do so much. You can't cheat the system. You can't cheat how nature works too quickly. So you do have to keep a, a, a steady but slow pace uh, in doing this. Now, one area that I found is when starting a tank, just start with one fish, one small to medium sized fish. And then in a couple of weeks, once everything's balanced down, well, now you can go with two. And then in a couple of weeks, once everything's balanced down, well, now you can possibly add three or four fish at a time. So it doesn't take that long once it gets started. It just you just have to let that bacteria catch up to it. That's a very important thing. Now we have a debate of captive versus wild caught. And there's pros and cons to both. So with captive caught fish, the pros are generally they're small in size when you acquire them. So you can have them for a longer period of time. Often they're already weaned onto a captive diet, usually even prepared pellets and, and foods like that. But even if not frozen food, they'll readily take. There's no horrible practices to how these ca are captured. Uh, it's possible for them to not even be exposed to pathogens at all, depending on the supply chain that they come through. But what are some of the cons with them? Well, we mentioned the small size, but sometimes it's a very small size where they may be prey to fish in your tank that, that aren't naturally a very predatory or aggressive fish. It's just the small size of these guys uh, makes them a challenge. I found to a degree, some of them can be less colorful uh, than their wild counterpart parts. There's also less variety of the species available in captive caught, uh, caught specimens or captive race specimens. If there's no demand, 
they can even be unavailable for a time. I know that this happened uh, for a few years with mandarins, right? So they were wild caught by, uh, I believe they were wild uh, bred by uh, ORA for a number of years. And ORA just discontinued it because there wasn't any demand because people could get a wild caught one for 20 bucks versus uh, a captive bred one for a hundred. But now there are places that have the captive bred mandarins, they've come back. But this is just a careful reminder that demand uh, affects how readily these guys are. I have found that there are some deformative, deformities that make it through uh, the process. I've seen numerous uh, assessors come in with a, a bent spine. Um, now this can be charming. This fish can live in captivity, whereas in the wild, mother nature would have called it mercilessly. Uh, but that's just something to keep in mind. And then uh, cons are, they can also be a little bit more expensive or significantly more expensive than their wild caught counterparts. Now with wild fish, some of the pros include there's a variety of sizes. So if you don't wanna wait for that ras to become a super male, you can get a wild caught super male ras uh, at that size. There's a greater variety of species. Uh, some can be harder, hardier than their uh, captive counterparts because here's what everybody needs to remember. Mother nature is trying her best to kill everything. So just a fraction, just a tiny portion of those that were spawned will actually make it to adult size. Uh, they can be, uh, if they're collected properly, wild caught fish can actually be beneficial for the longevity of the reefs. And the reason I say that is because uh, the people who are collecting these, uh, these fish, they are fishermen by trade. So if there's no demand for them to catch ornamentals, they're going to go to the subsistence food fishing. And food fishing is a lot more dangerous for the reefs because a, they're taking larger specimens off the reefs. These are the adult specimens, the breeding specimens uh, that have been on the reefs for a while. Usually in, in the marine uh, aquarium, the, the ornamentals that are caught are younger fish that are, are freshly come to the reefs from being their planktonic stages, right? So they don't really have as much of an impact. Also, these reefs can only hold so many fish. So many of these young fish are going to be uh, not living long or they'll be replaced immediately uh, by that repopulation of the reef. Now, cons on wild fish, though, is sometimes they can be bigger and be shorter lived. Uh, deep water species may have decompression issues. These guys may not be prepared or may not ever take prepared foods. They have been exposed to pathogens. And then in some locations, there are destructive practices. Now, I personally lean towards wild caught fish. I do like the benefits of the wild caught fish more than the captive, but captive also hold an important part because it's teaching us how to care to the best of the ability of these fish. Both have their values. More education needs to be done in these locations where they are using destructive practices. Net training needs to happen, um, but, but supporting the wild caught fish that are caught in a sustainable way is gonna do a long way to benefiting our reef aquarium hobby um, and making sure that things don't get caught up in wild bands and that activists that are can be radical don't shut down our hobby unnecessarily because they don't really care on that and they don't care how sustainable it can be, they want it shut down. So those are just some thoughts on that. Now it comes to quarantine or not to quarantine. I was gonna do a cheesy, uh, rendition of Shakespeare there applying to fish disease, but I decided the best of it, and I'm saving you all that kind of uh, corniness for another uh, a time. Now, since most of us, since we're doing this through the Humble Fish Forum, most of us, I think, are on board with the benefits of quarantining. Uh, if you can, I highly, highly recommend quarantining. Uh, this, this step can save you all kinds of headaches moving forward. It gives you peace of mind and it ultimately can cause less stress for you. However, that being said, this can be a, the uh, concept of quarantining can be a further barrier to someone just breaking into the hobby. Uh, that's more work, more time, more expense, more space, and there's more to potentially learn and possibly more to mess up. There are other possible steps. If you're not somebody who's comfortable with quarantining yet, again, I highly recommend quarantining, but there are steps that you can to uh, lessen the need for that. Uh, we have vendors where you can get pre-quarantined fish. So if that's not a step that you can do your own, there are places to buy quarantined fish. Uh, there, there's been steps made in uh, H2O2 dosing uh, that can help 
eliminate some of the parasites in the water. Uh, I used to quarantine at work and it just kind of got away from me uh, for my own per pers uh, personal fish tank. So instead what I use, and I'm not saying follow my example, is UV sterilizers is using those. Those can help a long way as well. So use a quality brand, an appropriate size wattage, and proper flow growing through there. So the brand that I recommend is Aqua Ultraviolet. I've had less problems with those. You also wanna make sure that it's an appropriate size. So there's a lot of teeny tiny UVs, particularly for like hang on the back filter aquariums. Uh, I've seen seven waters, I've even seen in tank ones. Those do not work as well as a, a properly sized and properly branded uh, UV. I've had a lot of problems with those. And then flow is another important part. You want it to go through there fast enough where you have good turnover of the tank volume, but not so fast that the UV sterilizer doesn't actually get a chance to do its job. So ways around that, they, UV sterilizers can be expensive, but it is well worth the investment if you are not going to quarantine. If you can, again, if you can quarantine, I highly recommend it. Now we move on to acclimation. You've gotten your fish and you're gonna acclimate them. And there's a lot of confusion, even on something this simple. See with freshwater fish, it's easy, right? You, you float the bag for 20 minutes and you let the fish go and perfect, you're, you're good to go. Well, it doesn't work as well, or it doesn't seem to be as easy with marine aquarium fish. So many suppliers, when you get it, they have their little info sheet on how long you need to do an acclimation. And they want you to do a drip acclimation for 45 minutes to two hours. This is crazy. Over the course of transport, the bag is sealed. So the CO2 that the fish exhale cannot escape. This drops the pH of the water and the ammonia that from the fish waste that's in that water is converted to ammonia. This is not nearly as harmful. However, when you open that bag up, the carbon dioxide can now escape, the pH is going up and the ammonium is converted back to harmful ammonia. And there can be a lot of ammonia in there. So some people think, well, why not put prime in there? Well, or some other dechlorinator, uh, or uh, I mean ammonia agent. Well, these can react harshly if there were chemicals such as copper used to treat the fish. So this can be just as toxic by doing this. In my experience, what I have found, it is best to limit how long the acclimation process is, particularly if the salinity is close, but even if the salinity is not close. So think of it this way, right? So ammonia, it burns the gills of the fish. This is how they breathe. It's a chemical burn on their breathe, how they breathe. If you had a chemical burn in your lungs, this is going to have much long lasting effects than the ionic uh, difficulties that they have when they're exposed to a different degree of salinity, right? So we have that same kind of thing when we have a hangover. So what's worse and more long lasting, a hangover or burnt lungs? Well, think of that for the fish. So getting them into properly oxygenated, uh, properly sal uh, proper salinity and clean water will cut down on the effects of this uh, so that we're not permanently damaging how they breathe. Also, acclimation is very stressful. They don't have anywhere to hide. Uh, they see movement up above them, which is us as we're acclimating them. That's super stressful for them. And then there can be low oxygen and variable temperatures. By quickly getting rid of the acclimation, and I just do it for temperature and put them in, fish often will deal with this just fine. Also think of areas where maybe you've gone swimming or diving in intertidal zones. There are many reef fishes found in some of these areas, and the salinity can change quickly and drastically. Most fish can handle this with minimal stress, in my experience. Now we're moving to introducing them to the display tank. Think of this, the wild, being on the wild, it's much worse than the wild west. A fish's instinct is to protect their interest, their territory, their food source at all costs. It means their life if they don't. Everything in the sea is trying to kill them. Fish will eat anything that can fit in their mouth and they don't wanna be the victims of anything that can eat them. And most of our aquarium fish, as far as fish in the wild, are on the smaller side of things. So once they're in an aquarium, uh, they don't understand that they don't have a predator right around every single corner or that they'll be, they don't understand that we're going to be there to feed them every single day. In the wild, it, it can be hit or miss. If there's a storm coming, they may be going three days without getting a reliable food source. 
So here are ways that we can make, cut down the stress, not only to the new fish, but to the fish that are already established in our tank. One, use an acclimation box. A couple days or even a couple hours can let you know how well the new fish is going to fit into the community that you have, what sort of dangers you're gonna to have to worry about. They'll be able to at least see areas, caves, territories where they can go to for safety when you release them. They get a layout of the land. Also, if there are aggressive fish, what happens is they're trying to get after the fish in the, in the acclimation box and they can't get to them. Well, after a while, they quit trying. They just think that they can't. So this is beneficial for when we release the fish that they're not getting attacked, that they're not being constantly stressed. When we release the fish, if there's still bad aggression it seems, uh, a trick that I found is putting a mirror on the side of the opposite side of the aquarium. Fish that are aggressive are usually most aggressive to similar fish. Fish also don't recognize themselves. They have no idea of self. So when they see a mirror, they think they see an equally sized fish that is coming into their territory and it needs to be dealt with. So they'll go fight that fish while leaving the new fish able to, to find their hiding place to get out, uh, their bearing, so to speak. Another trick is using food. If we feed, uh, fish often get distracted by the, the possibility of getting food. They're looking forward to getting food. Uh, so they'll do that and the new fish can go hide and, and not be stressed out that way. And another rare act is to turn out the lights. So this is something that's also good because fish go into hiding. Most of the fish that we keep as aquarium fish, they're out during the day. The predators all come out at night. So they want to go to their hiding space because they don't want to be vulnerable when the lights are out. Turn the lights out. Uh, the, the established fish go to hide. The new fish can go and, and chill out a little bit. And usually the next day, things are a lot better. Now, many sources will say to even to a rearrange the rock work. I do not like this idea. It's disruptive to the fish. It's disruptive to the biofauna that's in there. Sometimes you can have pockets that have been buried and have uh, uh, septic areas in the tank and you're releasing bad junk into the tank. Don't rearrange the rock work. Uh, if you need to rearrange rock work, you just add rock work or something like that. Don't uh, completely start over the whole thing. Now, what we're gonna do is move on to some common fish to avoid that I see listed for beginners, for starters all over. Number one on this list, my least favorite fish on the planet is the six line wrasse. Now the six line wrasse, it's often listed for beginners. It's hardy, it's colorful, it's popular. It eats coral pests. It's inexpensive, it's relatively small. It's smart, it has an interesting personality. So what's the problem with this? This is the single most common species I've had to catch out of established tanks. It's really hard. They're small, they're agile, they're smart, and they know the tank. The reason they have to get caught out is because they start out pleasant enough, they look great, but these guys are stone cold killers. They're relentless. They recognize other plank divorce, other forms of competition that they have that they want. And for the first six months or so, they're great. But then beyond that, their aggression begins to increase. I've seen them go after Halicorus wrasses twice their size. I've seen them go after uh, Antheus. I've seen them go after mandarins, going directly for the eyes of mandarins. This is a vicious little devil fish. Please, unless this is your priority fish, do not get it. If this is your priority fish, then plan around it and it can do just fine. But if you want a peaceful reef tank, this is one to avoid. Dotty backs. And I'm saying dotty backs in general. Now, there are a couple of exceptions to that. This is why it's principles and not rules. But for the most part, avoid dotty backs. Now, again, these guys are colorful, hardy, cheap, often listed for beginners. But these guys are territorial. And they'll be territorial even to exist pre-existing fishes. I had one customer buy against all course of wisdom. They had a large, well-established drama, and they brought in a dotty back that was half its size. It was a splendid dotty back. So it didn't look like the drama either. And within two days, we had to catch that dotty back out because it had torn up the fins on the much larger and well-established drama because, again, they wanted that pretty fish, but they didn't get the sense of how aggressive they are. These guys are also difficult to catch. They like their caves. They like hanging out on the rock work. They know how to do this. And then if, say, you end up having one of those tank wipeouts that can happen, and you're like, okay, well, this is the chance to get rid of one of my terrible fish, 
uh, dotty back is likely to survive disease, power outages, uh, while more desirable species end up perishing. Dotty backs are not good news. Avoid them if you can. Then it moves to damsels. Now, anybody who knows me on the forums know that Chrysiptera damsels are one of my favorite fish to add to a reef tank. However, Chrysipteras are the exception and not the rule. The rest of the damsels available are outright terrible. You look at something like uh, this three stripe or it's relative to four stripe damsel, my goodness gracious, they are terrible. They get big, they get nasty, uh, they'll attack anything. They don't care how big it is. I can't tell you how many times uh, we've had people bring back damsels. So they end up going into one of the coral display tanks at, at my work and you're doing algae and you're just getting bam, 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 hit by the, uh, the damsel that keeps going. And then you try to chase it away and try to catch it and it scoots away. They're very agile. They're like a quick little boxer. It just is coming right back. So it doesn't care if you're a, a 225 pound man or if you're another little fish in that tank, they will attack. And then what's worse is they're often sold as a starter fish, right? Because they're, they're among the cheapest of fish uh, available at pet stores. They're told, oh, yeah, they'll survive uh, the starting process, the cycle of the tank. So they're in the tank, and then you can't get them out because they're so agile, they're so quick, and they are so nasty that it severely limits what you can get in the tank. So again, for most tanks, damsels are not a good choice uh, to begin with, although they're a striking and very cheap fish. Next is boxfish, box and I'll include cowfish. Now, these are often not sold to uh, beginners, but when you walk into the pet store and see one of these uh, cute little guys just swimming around, they've got so much personality. They're so interesting. You haven't seen anything like this. My favorite fish of all time is longhorn cowfish. So it's in that group, uh, and they're relatively inexpensive, uh, inexpensive. This is one of those classic impulse buys. But that is a bad idea. Do not impulsively buy a boxfish or a cowfish. They're very prone to uh, parasites. Uh, they have trouble competing for food. They're, they're very slow and deliberate. And there's a low survival rate unless the system is designed for them. However, what I will say, this can go back to that priority fish, right? So when we go back to that principle, if your priority or must have fish is a boxfish or a cowfish, create an environment for them where they're not going to be uh, uh, presented with diseases and parasites, where they're not going to be outcompeted for food. This can be, this is one of the highlights of fish keeping if you decide to do it, but just for most people who want a mixed reef, it's not a good choice. Now, as we move on, we move on to fish to avoid that are often sold as groups. Again, firefish are one of my favorite fish for a reef tank. They're incredibly peaceful. They're interesting looking, they're vibrantly co colored. And in the wild, they're found in these large colonies. And often they're very cheap. So when you go to the, a fish store or, or any other place, you'll see a tank full of them. These fish, without showing much signs of outward aggression, it's really just flicking of that signal off fin on the top of them and, and their ventral fins. Uh, that's really all the aggression you ever see. You don't see a whole lot of chasing with firefish but the pairs are highly intolerant of other fish. They'll form a pair and slowly kill off any others in that group one by one, even incredibly large tanks. So this is something that it's a great fish to have. It's incredibly peaceful, but never get more than a pair and only get a pair if you can tell that it is a bonded pair, which can be difficult because sexing these guys, they're not sexually dimorphic. So uh, that can also be a challenge too. So avoid the impulse of wanting pairs. A lot of people want pairs, but if you can't identify it, only stick to a single specimen. Next up, group yellow tangs. In the wild, if you've ever seen images or gone diving in Hawaii, you see these large schools. It's just such impre so impressive to see these thousands of specimens of yellow tangs all swimming together and they're doing so peacefully. So this gives us the idea, it's like, well, if this is how they are in nature, well, maybe this is how we should do it in an aquarium. Wrong. So while in captivity, they're still beautiful, they, for the most part, do not do well in groups. So I've had them in groups successfully in a couple of tanks, and I'll tell you what happened. They were both, the times it was successful was in large 10-foot tanks. And what happened is once they became sexually mature, they would pair off and they would each claim uh, an area of rock work or about a two foot square area where those two tangs were allowed to be, but none of the other tangs were allowed to be there. So they divided that up and any odd number outs were killed. 
So it's difficult to do. Tanks can be uh, aggressive in general. And then when you add that uh, mating prospect, it increases the aggression. So it's not something that I would recommend uh, for anybody. You can have multiple tanks in a tank, just not multiple tanks of the same species. Then we go to Bengai cardinal fish. This is another one that's commonly sown in groups because they're cheap. So you have a tank full of them, but what happens with these guys is they end up uh, pairing off and they are intolerant of other, uh, other outsiders, other Bengai cardinals, because again, that's the greater competition. I once had a 10 foot tank where I put three of them in there and the pair, no matter how, where the third one was in this, uh, this 10 foot tank, they would send it to the corner and would go and kill it. And then they go try to go off and set their own little way. Um, and then anytime they would see that guy, they go off and kill it. So even a 10 foot tank wasn't enough for a group of Bengai cardinal fish. So they stuck to a pair. Well, this is just some of the principles that we have. Uh, as far as getting started on a reef tank, uh, principles again are not rules uh, because rules are in aquariums, they're not set in stone. This is not something that uh, you can say is going to definitively act a certain way. It's just probability going to act that way. Now, we also didn't spend time in going through every group of fish and what's good about them. That would take us forever. So if there ends up being interest in the future, that would be something that I'd love to do is, is doing groups of fish uh, group by group. Um, but we'll see how that goes now. I'm also willing to take questions today. So I hope you all enjoyed this and I hope it uh, was worthwhile. This is what is the best small shoaling fish? Uh, the best small, so the best shoaling fish, in my uh, opinion, is uh, zebra dart fish and uh, scissor tail dart fish. That's one of the single best species of that is they're very social. So even though they get to a decent size, they get to about four inches. Uh, they're so peaceful and they're so dumb and dopey that they don't care. They don't have an aggressive bone in their body. And the more that you actually have of the dart fish, uh, the better that they actually do in that. Um, there's other car cardinals as well that uh, do a good job, um, but not all cardinals. So it's like uh, Parvulus is a great schooler in shoaling fish, but they just need to be fed so much that I don't really like them for most people because if you can't feed them three times a day, they'll slowly die off. Uh, and then blue eye cardinals, they're a great shoaler. They stay a shoaler their whole lives. Um, but my problem with blue eye cardinals is to me, they're just a silver fish. And we get into salt water because it's supposed to be prettier and more vibrant. Uh, yeah, so usually the more sensitive tanks are tanks found in the surf zone. So like Achilles, Sohals, uh, Clown Tanks, these guys had just so much energy uh, because these are also the more aggressive ones too. So they have so much more energy that seems to be pent up in an aquarium. Whereas if you have a high, I mean, high, high amount of flow, this kind of cuts down on the aggression. And I also think that they kind of get so worked up at seeing all these other fish that they just get so mad at uh, is that anger causes cortisol levels to raise uh like that aggression so think of like somebody with uh that's just angry all the time they're going to have health issues that correspond to that so same thing with with these tanks they get mad all the time they've got a simple immune system so cortisol will cause that to not work as well so they're more stressed out there's less room so they can be a little bit more sensitive and aggressive because of that you have any pointers on how to introduce fish that can get aggressive in civic situations but can be kept together. Something like introduction sequence, would this really work? So fish that can be specific, uh, aggressive in specific situations, but can be kept together is something like, uh, like so take uh, swallowtail angels, right? So they're not as bad as other angels. Um, they're more haramic and they're more planktivores. However, if you put two of the same species in together uh, at different times, there can be great aggression. Um, but if you put them in at the same time, or you put the smaller one in first, this will uh, mitigate that. That can also be used with antheus like squamies. Uh, squamies can be pretty rough with each other, but if you get the females in there first, um, generally that can cut down on it, or the less aggressive species in there first, uh, that can cut down on it. Um, same thing with like uh, pseudochelanus wrasses, right? We mentioned the six-line wrasses, which is the worst out of the group, but mystery wrasses, that's a desirable wrasse, but they can be in the middle range of that pseudochelanus group. 
So let's say you're somebody like me who I like my leopard grasses, I like my helichorus grasses. Um, but if I wanted, I really wanted a mystery grass, what I would do is let my other grasses get very well established and then add that most aggressive fish in last. So that's again how that priority fish that we talked about having that must have, if you have know where it is and what else you want to keep, you can work around those orders and kind of play with it a little bit. You may have some aggression with that, um, but it can be limited. Uh, is there such a thing that a fish size will adapt to the tank it's in? This is one of the theories in the hobby that drives me nuts. It drives me nuts too. No, it does not adapt to the size it's in unless that size is much, much bigger. So uh, get, uh, it can stunt the growth if they're not having enough space in there. Um, it can also cause them much more aggression. Uh, it, they pollute the tank faster. Uh, and again, like with tangs, right? So a tang can fit in a tank that's bigger than, than four feet or six feet, right? But you see that as the minimum of that. And it's because of their activity levels. So if they're in a tank that's too small, even though their body can physically fit in there, they're not able to get that energy of their behavior out um, to really get rid of that aggression. And then it stresses them out, which makes them more susceptible to disease. What's your advice for fish feeding volume frequency? And is there any signs of underfeeding of overfeeding? So if most of us are dealing with reef fishes, which are planktivores, they eat little meals throughout the day. So if you look at the eye, that's about the size of their stomach for most fish. Now, when we think of a, a dietary, our uh, digestion tract of humans, right, we've got all the intestines that go like this in a big zigzag pattern, and it's miles long if we pulled it out and stretch it out. Fish, it's not like that. They don't have that zigzag. It ends up being like a straight line from their stomach to their anus. So they digest their food relatively quickly. Um, so really, they're designed more to have small, frequent meals throughout the day than one larger meal every day or every other day. So I do recommend... Uh, feeding only what they can eat in about 30 seconds. The beauty of that is if they still seem hungry or they, you don't feel like you fed enough, is you can always add a little bit more. If you feed too much, what happens is that food goes everywhere and it's wasted. The system still has to deal with the amount of food that you put in, but the fish aren't getting the full benefit of it. So what I do personally is I've got my lights set where they're still on for six to eight hours after I get home from work. And so every hour or so, I just feed a little bit. Like I'll get my food ready, frozen food ready in a little cup of tank water. I just pour a little bit in in the flow, let them eat that, come back an hour later. Now, I realize not everybody can do that. I also, if I can't do that, would utilize a, a, a feeding station with an auto feeder for pellets so that the, water, the pellets will feed them and they'll maybe get two meals a day that way. Because I also feel that pellets can be pretty healthy uh, for the fish and they help them put on weight. Sides of underfeeding and overfeeding. One of the numerous sides is if there's aggression at feeding. So if you're underfeeding, you're going to have a dominant fish really being competitive for the food that's being presented to them because there's that need, right? Whereas if there's plenty of food, you're not going to have that degree of aggression. Another thing to look at is once you're right past the gills, like where their lateral line is, uh, you can start to see it, it get skinny. So if you look at the fish, like if we're looking at a top by view, you kind of have the head and the tail and it kind of just creates a smooth football shape almost in that. And now if there's any point where it looks pinched and it's not that smooth uh, shape, well, that can be a sign that they're a little bit underfed. Again, if they're overfed, it's the same way we can tell if somebody else is overfeeding if they're a person. Are they a little bit overweight? Now having weight and size is healthy, but again, just the opposite of that pinch look, if it looks ballooned at any point, well, now they're getting a little too much food and you might want to keep an eye on that. Found about out about tile fish by reading your posts, any underrated fish that you also like, but people seldom stock. Uh, right now, fusiliers, if you can get them. Now, a true fusilier, it's one of those fish that if you see a documentary, it can be brilliant blue and brilliant yellow. Uh, they get to about a foot. Um, so you need a large fish, but they're incredibly peaceful, incredibly striking, but they just aren't collected in the trade very much. And I don't know why, because they're found by all the other fish. You see the images of them with uh, Squamianthius and the bicolor Chromis, and just for some reason, they're not as collected as frequently. Another one that I like is Pentapotus. So these are called whiptail breams or sunfish. Um, they're a long cylindrical shaped fish. You'll find that that's a theme uh, with fish that I like, and they're purple and yellow, and they're a beautiful fish, very peaceful, and they get these long streamers on their, their fins as well. And it's something that's not a relatively expensive fish either. It just isn't commonly come across. And 
why it isn't more popular, I just don't know. And then other ones that I like are some of the more exotic but not expensive wrasses. So uh, sometimes they're caught in a side catch. Is, so there's a fish that looks like a green uh, leopard wrasse. It's called a Xenojulus margarita sea. Um, and they used to come in as like just assorted wrasse. And they'd only cost a couple bucks from overseas. Um, but they just aren't. And they're a shallow water fish too. So you'd think that they'd be caught a little bit more, but they just aren't. And then there's Helichorus argus, which is similar to a melanurus wrasse, but just different. And again, it's caught in assorted wrasses and it's cheap and it's common throughout the wild where it is. I just think it's not targeted. Do you have a recommendation for reef safe angels? So again, it's going to go the swallowtails genicanthus. Um, I love Watanabe. Uh, that's my favorite. That's, I think, the prettiest looking one that's readily available. Now, if you're talking as far as uh, the quote unquote reef safe, like whether it's centripage uh, or something like that, it's just knowing what your risks are. So I find that flames and coral beauties are among the safest, but there's no guarantee on that. I've had specimens from every species of centripage that I've ever had nip at something. I've had some good specimens. So pygmies are generally good. Flames are on the safer side. Coral beauties are on the safer side. Evely eye even is on the safer side. But the more yellow they generally have, uh, the more nippy they can be. But if you want them, plan accordingly. So it's like they'll be fine with SPS. They'll be fine with most leathers, although I have had them nip at uh, toadstools with long polyps. But it's, it's a risk that you have to decide what's your priority, corals or the angelfish. Do I believe in maintaining a specific temp range of the tank for different fish? Something like keep low temp for jawfish theory, is that real? For the jawfish, not all jawfish, the low temp for the blue spotted jawfish is real. So where blue spotted jawfish come is uh, in the Baja region, uh, Catalina region of California. So if you've ever been to those waters, those waters are actually really cold, um, like in the 60s. So that would be something that for that fish, if you're trying to keep that fish, keep it at those temperatures, but if that's your priority. So you can have a cooler water tank. I wouldn't necessarily call it a cold water tank, but do blue spotted jawfish, do Catalina gobies, find other fish that live in those. And it'd be a brilliant tank because Catalina gobies are gorgeous, but it's not something that can be with all the other reef fish or it won't be long-term. I've never seen a blue spotted jawfish live a year or longer in a tank that's kept at reef temps. Now, well, there are plenty of other jawfish that you can do that with, uh, pearly headed jawfish, tiger jawfish, uh, the variable jawfish, the megamouth jawfish, dusky jawfish. There's a bunch of them available in the hobby. Um, so again, if you want the cool behavior of the jawfish, it won't be quite as cool looking as the blue spotted jawfish, but you can keep it. Um, otherwise you got to make that compromise there uh, in there. Keeping fish and also fish don't like uh, temperature changes. So the oceans are very consistent in temperature. Now that can be anywhere from 72 to 82 degrees, but just keep it consistent uh, as best you can. Can myacanthus blennies be kept in groups, pairs, mixed with other myacanthus blennies? They, I have found that same species do not like each other and closely related species do not like each other. So if you have a, a, one of the solid color ones like the uh, canary or the green, you're only gonna have one of those. And then maybe you can keep it with a gramistes, which is striped. Um, but so they view each other too much as competition. And then if I were to do that, I would also recommend to do that, uh, introducing them at the same time so that somebody doesn't have too much of an upper hand on the other one. And then I would also make sure that each fish had about two foot feet of space. So I wouldn't do it in anything smaller than like a 75 gallon aquarium. Well, that was amazing. Uh, I would like to thank TJ for uh, this wonderful uh, session we had today. Uh, I would like to thank everybody who tuned in and everybody who will watch later on uh, YouTube. Uh, hopefully we are successful in pushing uh, the right informations in the hobby. And finally, I would like to thank uh, Bobby uh, Humblefish for providing us this uh, uh, platform where we can uh, share information across uh, our users. Uh, so thank you all. Uh, and uh, see you all in the next session. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.